Electricast. If you don't wake up to what your mind is creating, and in many cases it's illusions and fantasies based out of fear and worry and doubt and anxiety, that you'll just keep creating that. And you don't have to create it. You can create something else. One of my friends who you've met, Patty Dobrovolsky, she said to me once, she said, you've got a choice. It's love or fear. Make your choice. She said, if you choose love, you can still experience fear, but it's not the dominating force. And I, I choose love over fear. Welcome to the Cosmic Love Antenna Podcast. This podcast is meant to encourage you to connect within so you can share your light with the world. And now, here's your host, Harrison Ma. Harrison Ma. Harrison Ma. Welcome, beautiful souls, to another episode of the Cosmic Love Antenna, your weekly installment of your inner connection to your outer expression. This is the space and place where I really set the intention of helping nurture the container needed to pull back and dive into the layers restricting health, alignment, and love. My guest today to help me do this, my guest to help me dive into these layers restricting this inner connection is the powerful Pete Cohen. Mr. Pete is the people's coach. He is a high performance coach in general. He is the author of 20 amazing books and is the mycelium man. Mr. Pete is, in my opinion, one of the most profound voices when it comes to helping you connect back inwards to your dreams, goals, habits, and mindset. And today, that's what we're going to get into. So Mr. Pete, welcome to the Cosmic Love Antenna. It's great. It's great to be here. Because uh, I feel a bit cosmic when you were talking. I was thinking about uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who many people know, who talks about the only thing that exists in the universe is the cosmos, is, is space and possibilities. And uh, I remember, you know, I came across him in the 90s when I saw a film called What the Bleep. I think, what the bleep do you know? And it was about quantum physics. And I didn't understand half of it. Mm. But there was something in some of the stuff that people said that read me really made me go, wow, I've never kind of thought of it like that. And there is so much abundance and so much possibility, but we have to be open to that, first of all. We have to see a world outside of the world that we're in, like the matrix, I suppose. It's it's funny, Pete, you bring up Joe Dispenza, and I, I want to get to him in a second because he's when I when I hear your voice and I hear you talk about all the future self elements that you really are passionate about expressing. You know, I can, I, I feel you channeling him. I feel you channeling Mr. Joe Dispenza with that sort of mentality. But before we get to that, I want to take actually a step backwards here, Pete. And what I like to do on the podcast is I know a lot of people maybe listening to this are fans of you or even in your club that we're hosting this room in right now. A lot of people have heard your story, but I still think a lot of people haven't. And I think our story, while it doesn't truly define all that we are, it does help us become relatable and become a beacon of light so people can be attracted towards us. So I'd love for you to share briefly about two of your pain teachers. And by pain teacher, I mean these challenges in your life that have helped you become the man that you are. And I'm going to be specific here because I you have many of these, <laughs> but I've picked out I've picked out two that I'd love to hear a little bit about here briefly. And those two are your testicle story. And the other is the health challenges that you had with your beautiful partner. So I'll throw it back to you. What comes up? Well, it's interesting when you were asking me then just to, to you know, talk about my story. And I, I haven't been asked that for a little while. And I was actually thinking it's getting harder because I relate to it less and less. But I know, like you say, it, yeah. definitely has, it definitely has a piece. I just feel more and more that I am not my story. I am the story I am becoming. Changing, and that's what yeah. excites me. That's what excites me now more than ever. So thank you because you just reminded me of, 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 of the story that I am creating. But yeah, look, uh, let's talk about the testicle first of all. You know, So for those of you that don't know what testicles are, um, you're not living on this planet. So you know, they are part of what makes a, a human male. Uh, and we, most of us are fortunate enough to have two. Um, when I was, I think maybe, maybe eight or nine years old, I, I noticed that one of my testicles was getting bigger than the other. 
And I was already insecure about myself anyway. I already had some serious, serious, I don't know, insecurities. Yeah, we all, right like way. we all do, right? Yeah, serious <laughs> self-doubt, thinking that there's something wrong with me. I was convinced there was something wrong with me. And now, physically, I had a physical, manifest, a physical manifestation of something I believe, like what some people might call a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I was ashamed of, of myself, but I became more ashamed of myself. So I hid myself away. I played a lot of sport, but I would not take my clothes off. And I'm sure people noticed, but no one said anything. And then there was a little bit of piss, you know, we were piss taking or banter, which is a real male thing, which is very, very toxic. Um, and I just became more and more ashamed. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually it got so bad that um, I phoned the doctor, but then I canceled the appointment. Mm -hmm. I did that through. I was, I was frightened of what I'd find out, frightened of exposing myself. And then eventually it just got so big. I saw a photograph of myself and went, oh my God, that's just, yeah. I'm going to have to do so. I went to the doctor and he immediately looked and I actually remember what he said. He goes, you know, I think this is cancer. And I, I was only like 16, I think, or 17. And I had to call my mum and tell her. But thankfully, immediately we went and had um, a scan and it was, it was benign. So I had to have surgery to rem remove the cyst. It's funny because the testicle is still bigger than the other one, but you know, well, it's, it's funny. Like Pete, it's funny that you say that. <laughs> yeah. What are you saying? Hey, no. Well, so no, but <laughs> I, just to be totally transparent, honest here, you know, the first time I heard you hear this story, you know, I I relate both not just physically anatomically, uh, anatomically, but not not the extent in which you went through with the actual cyst and the and the growth of it, but yeah, the, the different sizes. And, but also I related, you know, I, I speak a lot about the inner child and maybe people that have listened to this podcast are sick of me saying this so far, but I'm going to keep it ringing to the home. And while I bring it up here, Pete, I imagine you moving through this, right? I imagine you moving through this. When did it start? So 16 was when you were finally hit the wall with it. But yeah, so it's about six years of, yeah. of, of probably going through this. Yeah. And I think we often forget that part of our childhood development is a healthy relationship with our sexual being, right? So would, would it be fair to say that this disrupted that, my friend? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> There's no question about that, you know. So um, it's, and, I want to keep hearing the rest of the story, but I just want to plant that seed for people lis listening that, you know, this is not just a physical thing. This is not just a physical thing as Pete is sharing the story really feel into the emotions and the energetics behind this and what Pete would have been through and what was released once he finally leaned in. Keep, keep, yeah. keep hitting me, my friend. Yeah, no, I mean, even, you know, for years afterwards, you know, just you go through something again, it's a, well, just because the operation was done. What about the trauma? Yes. Yes. You know, when did I deal with that? Well, it yes. took years and years and years and years. And that's, you know, why it's such an important conversation to have because yeah. you think about what people go through, yes. which is amazing. Human beings, we're so adaptable. Okay, great. But what is the cost of the adapting? And right now in our world, we know that we, what have we been through? Well, you know, it's pretty crazy without even COVID. You can imagine, you know, lockdown after lockdown, you think about what it's been like in Australia. What's the impact of that? Who's talking about that? Who's saying, hey guys, no, no, and it's like because let's just get on with it. What really? Well, hang on. What's going to be the the long term impact of that? What about our children? The impact of them? No one. Who's talking about that? Children yeah. not being able to go out. Children have to wear masks. Children. It doesn't make sense. And if for human beings, we're very lucky that we have the expression of words as a way of making sense of our reality. And that's why talking is very beneficial. Therapy get, can be very beneficial. Don't get me started, Pete, on this. This is a whole other tangent, but I'll, I'll just, I want to keep hearing about your story, but I'll just, I'll plant this additional seed here because we're on this inner child conversation. You brought up the pandemic. I uh, was in a room this morning and talking about the inner child and its connection to physical disease. And we often overlook, so I just talked about the sexuality element of the inner child expression, but we also don't, we also overlook our the out the ability that a child needs to mirror slash echo what is happening with the outside world and you can imagine how like you just said with the lockdowns you know and i'm not here to be controversial about masks whatever your opinion of it i think what we cannot overlook is how the masks for example 
we're able to obstruct emotion, obstruct smile, smile, right? So any, any emotion, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah, just as people are listening, sit with these things and realize that this inner child dynamic plays in many ways and it shows up in the body across mind, body, and spirit. Well, you know, so, so what you just said there makes me realize just the importance of being a love vessel, getting your love antennae super fired up that when you meet anybody, just give them some love. Because that's what people need, right? What's the antidote to fear? Well, I mean, it has to be love, right? So, you know, just to say to someone, hey, how are you? My wife and I, when, you know, we go for walks every day. Um, she will say to everyone, hello, good morning. And she means it. She's giving someone something. And what, what greater gift can you give any human being than the gift of I love you? But you don't actually have to say those words, even though that's a nice thing to say to, yeah. you know, Welcome, sure. welcome to the one of the intentions of this podcast, my friend. So I'm happy you're already in it. You're in the cos, you're in the cosmic love. It's coming, it's moving through you, Pete. Um, I was speaking of your partner and your beautiful wife. Can you give us a quick share and story about? Because this was the other point I wanted people. I want people to hear about your beautiful journey and again this this being that we're listening to and the and the and the work that you do in the world. I know that. You know her health challenges. I think she had cancer, right? Was it? Was it a, a brain tumor? Brain tumor, yeah, a brain tumor. Can you speak a little bit about that and yeah, how it's course, impacted? Of course, of course. Um, so, I think it was twelve years ago. In fact, on April the first, I think it was twelve years ago that she had surgery and wasn't given long to live. Um, but I'm one of these people very fortunate right so fortunate to have the parents that i had and that's why i remember you know one of my heroes is michael jordan right this might seem like a tangent but michael jordan when his father died when michael was about 32 i think his father was murdered i remember hearing michael jordan say he goes i'm lucky i had my dad for 32 years some people never had that you know and um i, I had parents for 50 you know 50 years of my life uh, my mum died a year ago. My dad died a few years before that. But my mum always said, look, it's not, there's an answer to everything. She, she didn't actually tell me that. She just showed me that, with who she was. And my dad said, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So I was really massively hypnotised that if I meet someone, I've got to know who is this person and how can I connect? My dad was also a Rotarian. And the, the motto of Rotary is you seek service over self. So it's all about service. So when my wife was diagnosed with this, um, you know, she had a massive epileptic fit, rushed to hospital. I had a coach who I worked with for 16 years and I contacted him and I asked him, what should I do? He said, find people that are still alive with the same brain tumor and find out why. And then he said, what is she going to do when she gets better? So I did find people that were still alive. I didn't ask her the second question for three years, but basically, and I tell you, when I think back, of the trauma that I went through. And this is something I've been thinking about recently and having to kind of revisit and readdress for a few different reasons, the, the trauma that I went through, because it was incredibly traumatic uh, for so many reasons. One of the reasons was there was just obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. I mean, I've probably forgotten half of what we had to go through because I found people that were still alive and I found a treatment in America that cost a few hundred thousand dollars and, uh, but just waiting for the FDA to sign to sign a release for her to be an example, uh, uh, you know, to get on so, it. So, Pete, let me let me jump in here super quick because this is really interesting, and this is this is bubbling up in me, and I want to ask you this. So, I something I teach a lot about is soul contracts and walking along a soul path, right? And I think mm -hmm. you probably have the same sort of beliefs around this, and. I think we often overlook, especially with the people that are in our lives and the relationships that we're in, we overlook what they give us, right? Meaning that when they move something along their soul path, that is a challenge, that is a pain. So in this case, your, your partner's, you know, what she was moving through with her brain tumor. We often overlook because obviously we want to be there to help them. We want to be there to love them. We want to be there to guide them and give them what they need. In that process, I feel often we can overlook what they're what their pain, what their lessons, what their challenges are giving us, right? What that is allowing us to do. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Pete, but it sounds like with all the spaces and places you went based off what you needed to do with her, it sounds like it gave you a lot. It sounds like it oh, gave you a lot. 
I just didn't know at the time. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I look back and retrospect and realize, I mean, there's so many things that came from that. Yeah. So one of the biggest things, you referred to me as the mycelium man, you know, through, uh, you know, how we're connected. We're connected on many levels, but we're connected through Paul Check, who, yeah. you know, yeah. I know Paul, you've studied with Paul. Yeah. Paul Check used to, um, what's the word, when you work, he used to work with uh, Dr. Rakowski, yeah. Yeah. who yeah. I met in Houston, Texas, who yeah. we met when, when my wife was being treated, and then he introduced my wife to a ketogenic diet. And then said, look, if you drink coffee, drink this, because the coffee had the mushroom in it that, you know, there's over 3,000 medical studies. So do you know how many people every single day drink a cup of that coffee? Because, <laughs> because of I that mean, choice. Because of that choice. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I mean, right yeah. now there's probably, I don't know, someone in, who's listening to this is probably drinking a cup of that coffee yeah. because of my wife had a brain tumor and their life is better because of that. I mean, yeah. that's just one. So, and it's not but even... That's having a, Go on. Sorry, it's, sorry uh, just, I'm getting so excited, Pete. It's and it's not even you. That so now it's not even a soul contract between you and your partner. Now it's a soul contract between the other people that have been affected by the mycelium and the mushrooms. And yeah. this is this is something else that I want people to consider and to sit with. And this is just my belief. So take this, feel it in your body, and see if it resonates. If it doesn't resonate, let it go. But a big part of the audience that listens to this podcast are very spiritually inclined. And like I mentioned how we, we have, we have soul contracts and a soul path. We also, before I believe before we come into this incarnation, we, we sit down and we, and we look and we write down, okay, this is what, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to impact. This are, these are the shifts that I want to learn. These are the lessons I want to go through. I'm wondering, Pete, if you think that that mycelium and that mushroom was part of that predetermined yeah, path. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I love, I love what you say. Uh, it, it's, so, it's, it's so deep when you start having these conversations because it's like the cosmic world is infinite. So we open up a doorway that literally there's infinite possibilities. But what you just said there reminded me of what my coach said. He said when you look at religions and you look at the origin of it and you look at the, the origin story, mm -hmm. one of the stories that you hear over and over and over again is once we were a beam of light yep. and we saw a life for us to go and lead. And we chose the life, as you said, because of the many challenges that you wanted to go through to evolve as a spiritual being. And then when you chose the life, and you went into, you know, the sperm, the egg, you then forgot all of that. It was like, phew, it's gone. And now you are you up for the test? Now, it's up to, like you said, it's up to everyone, whatever you want to believe. And I, I, I'm not here, we're not here to tell anyone what they should and shouldn't do. It's none of our business. But it, it, I think we share our truths. And my truth is I am a spiritual being living in this physical body. And that's it. And the more I realize that, the more, I don't know, the more power it gives me to look at the infinite <laughs> possible. I don't often talk about this stuff. So, you know, I love I keep it. it Pete, keep it, yeah, keep yeah. it, keep it coming, Pete. This, <laughs> that's what this podcast is about. I love it. So, yeah. I, I, I want to, I want to keep mining this from you, my friend. But now I want to, so thank you for sharing your story about the testicle. Thank you for te sharing it about your partner. I hope that gives a bit of foundation here for people that don't know you that can, can relate to a little bit of your experience and your journey. And I agree with you. I think our stories are a part of us, but we're an ever evolving being. And when you said you're a spiritual being having a human experience, I think my whole audience just tuned into your energy because it's something I repeat all the time. What, what I want to do now is I want to channel this spiritual energy through some of your pieces of brilliance, Pete. And like I said in the intro, one of the pieces of brilliance you share as a coach, and what's funny, you were just doing a room on this on Clubhouse before we started, is on the topic of habits, right? So I want to throw it back to you, my friend, and let's start with this question and we can filter in the spiritual lens. What, what would you say to someone that trying to implement a successful habit? What do you think are the go-to sort of things that come up in your mind to share? 
Well, well, first off, when, when, when I'm having a conversation like I'm having with you, the person who's benefiting the most from this in my eyes is myself because I am reflecting on myself. And I just had an epiphany um, of, you know, if I'm a spiritual being living in this human body, what is the vehicle I have chosen to help people mm. tap into their spirituality, to step, to step into their, whatever you might call it, your greatness, it's through habit. It's through habits. It's, it's, you know, I think habits are our superpower in terms of what, you know, what could we do that would literally transform our lives? And I would say it's our ability to look at ourselves with a curious mind to know that we, we are where we are. This is the place to be and that we have a choice and the greatest choice that you will probably make it, Yeah. It's who you choose to become. Um, being connected to the person that you want to be. I think this is so missing, but you talk about inner child. Yep. The inner child, children children have this natural disposition to be excited about something mm. they're going to do. I believe the only reason we learn to move, the only reason we learn to communicate is because we want something. So mm. we, we make noises because we want, what do we want? We want to be fed, we want an apple to be changed, we want to be held, we want to be, we want love. You know, love stimulates the growth of the brain. That, that's been proven, right? You know, there were babies in, I remember one of my partners went to um, Romania. She was working with children with HIV. And back then, they thought that if you touch a child with HIV, you could catch it, right? So there was all these children that weren't touched. And they saw years later that the, the brains were much smaller. So we know that the stimulus, so they want to be touched. They want to be held. They want love. Then they learn to walk. Why? Well, because they see something that's over there. They want to go and get it. They go and it's not easy, and then the body can't can't do it. But the brain goes, "Well, I'm forget that. I'm in charge. Let's go." But as we get older, our bodies start taking over a little bit. I think. But the point I'm trying to make here is that knowing that energy—that's for me the childlike yes. energy of wanting something. A child that goes, oh, "I want to do this. I want to be this." what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be this. I want to do that. Or a child that when there's something's happened that was so amazing, they can't <laughs> wait to tell someone about it. Like, yeah. And that's an energy which is quite hard to contain, you know, but that is the, it's, it's the human experience that maybe for, to, to do something that you want to do and, and know that it's not always going to be easy and, so for me, it's about it's about about habit. Habits is a great way of tapping into your ability to learn to evolve. Because I think as we're here, if we get into the habit of evolving and growing, it becomes infectious, and we just want to keep doing it. So, Pete, I'm gonna I'm gonna check off your intention of wanting to learn, and I'm gonna add something here that might expand your awareness around what you just said. So, first of all, thank you for sharing that. I hope that I loved that analysis of implementing habits from the inner child perspective. And I think what a lot of people overlook is that when we talk about that spiritual being that you just talked about before, that spiritual being that's having this human experience, the inner child consciousness is a part of that, right? So you just, you just highlighted that power and that energy that the inner child has when we first come into this world. And I would say, that what that energy, what that power, what that potential that you notice is that full spiritual being, right? And, and it's because, and this is what I want to get your perspective on and how this feels for you. We know that the childhood ego mental structure doesn't develop until, you know, six, seven, you know, moving beyond up until that point, that spiritual being has a full reign of awareness within the physical body. So everything that you're saying about that pure childlike potential that is flowing through us to help us have habits and goals and all these things. A big part of it is because that spiritual being is unbounded. How does that resonate for you? Oh, it's, it, it's, you know, it's like anything is possible to a child. They don't understand impossible. They don't understand. That's why they ask the question, why? Why, 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 why? Because th there is some fear attached because they don't understand. So they want to know, they want to learn. Yeah. But then it all goes wrong for most of us because, you know, 
our parents who've got their own issues and own challenges. And then school. I mean, for me, school is just a complete waste of time. <laughs> it was just a, it was pathetic for me. I can't speak for everyone else. It was like everything I was good at was taken away from me or not encouraged. You know, for me, what was the point of learning? I don't care what anyone says. For me, maths, I mean, I understand, but if it would be taught to me in a way that stimulated me, I would have wanted to continue to learn. I, I, I Conforming word, to me. The word is stimulate, to, Pete. The word is yeah, stimulate. Yeah, I, I was, I was yeah. unstimulated, which means yeah. boredom. Yeah. You know, my coach once said to me that he said, you know, you're a lot like Jesus Christ. And I went, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, what do you know about Jesus? And I said, well, I know a bit. I am Jewish. I mean, I was brought up as a Jew. I went to, I had a bar mitzvah, but I went to a Catholic school. Um, so I learned about the, the New Testament and the Old Testament. And he said, you know, Jesus uh, was a rebel. You know, he rebelled against what he was being told. And uh, this is my interpretation of the story. I mean, the Jewish religion has 613 laws. You want to live your life by 613 laws? I don't personally, but if you do, I love you for that. Good luck with that, you know? Um, and he was a rebel. He rebelled against, and he, he went away and he discovered himself. That, again, my interpretation of the story. He found in the kingdom of heaven, he found the spirit within him, the God within him, which is what... Um, that's what the spirit is to me. It's the, the, the universal energy that exists with all of us. And I'm a rebel. I've rebelled against someone telling me what to do. I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me what to do? I'll and, do what I want. <laughs> and Pete, that's natural. So, so going back to the context of the school, just I want to hit on this quickly and I have another question I want to ask you here. But I mean, I don't know, maybe people in the clubhouse room can post in the chat or if you're listening to this podcast, you can let us know in the comments and, I mean, I think I know I personally can relate with that with that school conversation around being restricted, right? I grew up much like you. It sounds like Pete in a in a school system that told that taught me what to think, not how to think, right? And we are intrinsically creative beings, right? And I want to make this very clear for every single person listening to this podcast: we are all creative. Right? There is not a single person that it doesn't have creation energy inside of them. The question lies in how much of that creation energy has been suppressed, how much of that creation energy has been restricted and, like you said, honed into one way of being rather than being, uh, being allowed to expand into the way of being that is true for the individual. Yeah, and that's where, you know, you're brilliant at that. You know, I watch you, I see you close your eyes because you're going in, you're checking in. You're checking in with what's going on, you know, and um, that's what I'm thinking of that song by Marvin Gaye called What's Going On, which was a reflection of what is going on in the world and him saying, let's wake up and let's talk about what is going on. And I think there's a lot of fear attached to being creative because in, if you're going to be, what can you create? Yeah. And this is the thing I love to, I'd love to have that conversation. You know, what, what could you create? What are you creating? And this is one of the things I understand with the mind. The mind is a very powerful tool, but the mind plays tricks on you. If you don't wake up to what your mind is creating, and in many cases it's illusions and fantasies based out of fear and worry and doubt and anxiety, that you'll just keep creating that. And you don't have to create it. You can create something else. One of my friends who you've met, Patty Dobrovolsky, she said to me once, she said, you've got a choice. It's love or fear. Make your choice. She said, if you choose love, you can still experience fear, but it's not the dominating force. And I, I choose love over fear. It, again, it's not always easy because life often throws challenges that fear seems like it's taking over. But for me, I choose love. I think we have a choice. And I, you know, I, I choose love. We, I think that's another thing we forget. We always have a choice. And what you were saying about the being we're not fearful we're we're not fearful of what we're doing we're actually fearful of what our actual potential is it reminds me of the mary Ann williamson quote and i just i just i just brought it up here right just to repeat it for people who haven't heard it i think it's profound our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond all measure it is our light not our darkness that most frightens us and i think that fear and that frightened element of our light is programmed Right, not to get off in a whole conspiracy sort of perspective here, but our light and our potential inside of us is innate. 
it is there to begin with. It is exactly what you just said with the childhood being that comes in full of potential and energy. And it is there when we create the abundance, the healing, the relationships, the finances, all of the things that we deserve to connect into in our adult life. So the question I would ask people to sit with, why is that fear there for you? And if there is something, if there is a belief that's playing over in your head, ask yourself, is that belief true or not? Well, I don't know if you've ever watched, have you ever watched Star Wars? It's one of my favorite films of all time, my friend. Right, great. So I watched that well, before you were born, my friend. I'm a little bit old. I'm old enough to be your father. I'm your father, Luke. <laughs> Nine, yeah, 1977, I watched that film. I was seven years old and it just blew my mind. But why? What was it about the story? Well, for me, it was about the light, you know, the power of the force. And we relate to the story because we know it's true in our own choices, but also the way the world works. A lot of people have chosen, I would say, the dark side, the dark side. And maybe they didn't even know they were choosing it. Of, You know, life is about, yeah, it's like um, I was talking to someone about rap music the other day. Rap music started as a form of expression of what was going on. It wasn't about fame, power, sex. It wasn't about that. You know, the, the, the original songs were about, look at what's happening here. Uh, but it changed into something else. And maybe that's the path that people chose for that. And that's how industry works. Industry works for it, most organizations exist to maximize the shareholder, to line the pockets of people that want to make money, mm. uh, as opposed to doing something for the betterment of humanity. And now we're waking up to a consciousness all around the world that people are going, look what we've done. Look at what our ways have done to the planet. Look at what it's done to ourselves. And uh, these are the conversations, you know, when you think about what's going on right now in, within the Ukraine, we, we, we lose a lot of people going, hang on a second, hang on, this cannot be right. And now we're seeing, you know, I think Ukraine borders, I don't know, is it five, six or seven countries? Yeah, a, lot. A, lot. a lot of countries and a lot of people, those countries are saying, oh, they're opening their borders and saying, come in, yeah. we're going to take care of you. Let's shoot. We're going to love you. We're going to yes. give what we haven't, we haven't even got because that's the greatest expression. I suppose the challenge is sometimes we don't, it's just what, again, going back to Dr. Joe Dispenza, he says you can either be driven from pain and, and suffering or you can be driven by possibilities. And I, I like the idea of both, you know, to be driven out of the circumstances. I don't like this, let's make it better. But I wanna make the world better, you know. Again, it sounds like a cliche. I wanna leave the place better than when I first came here. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a cliche at all, my friend. I think it's just a truth that we all forget. Right. And on that, on that Ukraine conversation, just to hit on that point, I think a lot of us just using this example, a lot of us feel that the only way we can help and add to the collective with our love, like you said, is actually interacting with the event physically or interacting with a person or donating money or going to the front line or, you know, doing all these obvious steps. But what we often overlook is remember that we are interconnected. We are part of this mycelium network of beings, right? And when we shine our light inwards to expand that light as an individual, we are part of a collective matrix, right? So me standing strong in my love, right? Impacts the collective at large. Now, when you add in an intention, so let's be specific with this. Let's get, let's give an example. Let's say I'm running a course, right? I'm running a course for all these people I'm coaching. And in that course, I'm helping them connect into themselves in a space of love. If I sprinkle in, into that act of love that I'm committing for myself with these people, the intention of I'm going to direct all the love, all the light, all the energy, all of the hope, all of the kindness to Ukraine we're not at a point anymore where we can say that that doesn't have an impact, right? We know of how energy transcends time and space. We know of the Maharishi effect, right? When people meditate in one location, they set the intention and it impacts someone on the other side of the world. Does that, do you agree with this, my friend? Yeah, no, of course it's, you know, I was thinking about that, you know, we think about right now, we're being connected by the internet, right? You're in Australia, yeah. I'm here in England, we're on Clubhouse, we're on Zoom, and that's the internet. Thank you, the internet. But the, what about the internet? You know, that's what I'm interested in. And that's what, you know, some people call 
the mycelium. So the mycelium, you know, is what's under the earth. It's the largest living organism on earth. It, it feeds the trees, it feeds the plants. Without it, would, it's mushrooms, basically. Um, and they're as old as we are, but we have that in a net as well. And, you know, this might sound crazy to people, but I think of Putin and I send him love. I want him yes. to feel love. Yes. I want him to feel like, because I believe that if he felt true love, that he would wake up and go, this is not right what I'm doing. It's just choosing to put love into the world. And, uh, you know, you talk about the Maharishi effect. I remember, you know, learning transcendental meditation many years ago and coming across a study that was done from people that meditated and they, they brought down the crime rate. And yeah. I think it was in Washington state. Yeah. Um, and it's like, well, some people would say, well, that's not true. It's like, okay, great. Okay, you come around to my house and I'll be in a bad mood. And let's see how long you go. I, hang on, I don't want to be around you. You know, and it's like, do we not realize that if we can learn to, and this is again, coming back to Dr. Joe Spencer, if we can learn to think greater than we feel, then we have so much power to impact everything yeah. else around us. Yeah. Um, but it's just a different perspective. It's just like the matrix again, you know, which reality do you want to live in? The red or the blue? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Which one does he take? Does he take the red pill? Uh, I think the blue pill is the one that wakes the him up. The blue pill, yeah. yeah. Well, there's yeah. another term for the blue pill these days. And, you, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's um, another conversation. Take, that's, a, that's a, yeah. Well, it's funny how they found, that's funny how they found the blue pill. They weren't looking for it. And that's what happens when you start looking for the betterment of yourself, what you can find along the way. I want to add something to what you just said, Pete. And then I want to talk about, a topic that you're very passionate about. But before we get there, I just finishing the Putin conversation. I, two things. One, I think we often feel that love is weak. I think we often, and maybe this is my own programming speaking here, but I think when we act from a space of love, I think there is still programming around us that says that that's emotional, that's sensitive, that's vulnerable. But I want to, I want people to remember that love is also powerful. Love is confidence. Love allows me to express my truth. I can be angry and mix that anger up with my love. And now my anger becomes the voice, the boat of my truth. And how have I done that? I've done that through adding in love. So just with, not just with Putin, but with everything, I want people to remember that love is feminine, is, is that flowing nature, but it could also be the masculine, powerful nature as well. The other side, because we talked about the inner child, I want people to sit with this conversation too, right? Hurt people, hurt people. And I'm not condoning any sort of act around the Ukraine, Ukrainian challenge. And of course, all these people need to be help, help, helped and help and supported. But also ask yourself the question, where are these actions coming from, from the person making them, right? Are they coming from a place of confidence, love and, 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 and healed, a healed foundation? Or are they coming from a place of pain? Remember, it's much easier to project our pain outwards than go inwards and do the work, right? So I think that is where a lot of the compassion and empathy I have helps me take a step forward. Just on that, very sorry to interrupt you. No, go, um, go. You know, my brother is a, is a psychotherapist, his wife is a psychotherapist, and we often talk about, you know, these things. And many abusers were abused. Yeah. You know, so what's the answer? Just lock them up and throw away the key. Mm, okay. I'm not sure you know, to have compassion for someone's experience. Uh, you know, sometimes people do what they do until they know better. And sometimes when they know better, they, they do better. So, you know, it's a difficult conversation to have with some of the things that maybe people have done in their life, but it's like, there's always a story behind the story. And that's the thing I'm really interested in with the work that I do with people. So thank you for bringing that into, you know, into the conversation because it's important. Yeah. And it's, it's how I act, right? So I try to express from my space of experience. And I found it's helped a lot. Speaking of experience, my friend, I, I want to switch the chat now to the future self. And I know this is a, a passion to say it's a passion. I think it's a very under underrated statement for you, my friend. It's a part of the energy that you spread out and share with the world. So let's get into this topic and let's probably start with how would you define what a future self is? So, you know, I'm like, I'm like you, I'm forever learning. I'm ever forever curious. And I know that um, there's a guy called Dr. Benjamin Hardy, who I came across a few years ago. And I, he, he, it really annoyed me because he's got this book called Willpower Doesn't Work. 
And I think, that's it, that he does. But I've spent years studying that subject, and now you're telling me it doesn't work. But I looked at his work and could see there were some really interesting things that he was saying about it, that environment, if you're not in an environment that supports your growth, you can have all the willpower in the world. It's hard. And I thought, that is a really good point. And then I came across something he was saying about future self. And one of the things he said is that he doesn't believe in personality testing, that personality testing is just... Most of it is based on pseudoscience. It's, it's, it's rubbish, most of it. You know, Myers-Briggs, um, DISC, and it just like people want to put themselves in a box and say, this is me, this is who I am. And I really found that, and I thought, I'm going to dive into this a bit deeper. And then I realized that everything we do, I believe, as human beings, is governed by our desire to avoid pain, mm. right? People say gain pleasure, mm, maybe, but then what happens when you've had the pleasure? Well, you go back to pain again. Yeah. And unless you, you break the cycle, and to break the cycle, I would say is, well, maybe there's something you need to address in yourself, some sort of trauma, mm. but also the fact that you're limited by your view of the future. And we know that everything we do is driven by our view of the future. Mm. We're not driven by our past. I think it affects our, our present, but we're driven by our view of the future. So how's your future looking? Do you know who you're going to be tomorrow? Everyone knows that, don't they? I know who I'm going to be in, in half an hour. I know who I'm going to be on Thursday. I know where I'm going to be. I can see it. I can see myself. It might not turn out that way, but I have a relationship to me on Thursday and next week and next month. I never had a relationship with myself beyond a few months. Why would we? We're never encouraged to do that. We're never encouraged to um, dream big and so that I believe most people are living a future they don't want. And I, and, I, and, I, and I know now from the work that we do with people that we're able to help people be excited and build an empathetic relationship to their future self. They're guided. Some people might call that their higher self. Yeah. Well, you let know? me, Pete, let me jump in on that point because that's actually what's bubbling up in me. So first of all, I have, to, I have something to share with you that I want to make sure everyone hears. Uh, this work that you're talking about with the future self is actually one of the reasons this podcast that everyone is listening to exists right now. I participated in Pete's uh, 30 day challenge where he talks a lot about the future self. And in that challenge, one of the images and meditations that he runs is he has this image and meditation of going into the sculptor, the sculptor's den and looking through the, the piece of sculptured rock and imagining the future self that we want to create when we start chipping away that sculptured marble to make the future self that we deserve. And I think it's, I think that's a beautiful image in itself. And I, and I encourage people to sit with that and reach out to Pete to do the challenge because I found it very impactful. But when I did that experience, this podcast came up, right. And yes. I, I want to, and I want to thank you, my friend, because it's been such a roller coaster and it's really every single day it's it's I'm connected to it in such a spiritual impactful way. So thank you, my friend. No, that's great. Well, that's why I do what I do, you know, because yeah. <laughs> I want to see things blossom and the fact that people might listen to this who I've never met and they might never know anything about me just because I interacted with you. Yeah. And it's that soul contract piece that we were talking about before, but let me, I want to maybe challenge you here with something that bubbled up as you were saying, you said that we avoid pain, that part of the human, human experience is that we avoid pain and move towards pleasure. Do you think that avoidance of pain is, so we said before, let me get a bit of context here. We said before that we are a spiritual being having a human experience. Is the part of us that is avoiding the pain, is it the human being or is it the spiritual being? What are you, what's your perspective? That's a great question because mm. I would actually say it could be both. Mm. But the spiritual being would be, would be saying, what is this pain, pain here to teach you? What is this that you need? What, what is this here for? This is for you. Not Again, it's that whole thing around this is happening for me, yes, not to me. So that, that, that's what I would say to that. And that's, that's uncomfortable because it means you've got to look at it and own it and rather than, and then say I'm more than this. I'm, you know, it's, not, it's not mine. This is, this is, this is temporary. That's exactly, that's exactly what I wanted you to say, my friend. That's exactly what I felt when you said that point. And we have to remember, and for people listening, if, that, if that's triggering you, then that's beautiful, right? Because that's something to look into in itself. And the reason I say that, just to add on to what Pete said, is that spiritual being, the reason that spiritual being is in the human form 
is to grow and expand. Pete talked about this before. It's to expand the consciousness, is to learn the lessons in the life school that we're in, in the human earth school that we're in. And it cannot do those lessons without the pain. The pain is inevitable. The suffering is an option. Does that resonate? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No, that's that. Again, suffering is, is an optional. But yeah, pain is inevitable. It's just anything that I've also often think about this a lot. Anything that grows, anything endures pain. We talk about growing pains as physical pain. So, but, and this is the thing if you want something, the greatest expression I think of human beings is, is obviously love and then being able to create something that comes to you. But knowing if that's what you want to create, <laughs> don't expect it to be easy. It's like you're going to have to go through something yes. that's going to challenge that growth because that seems to me how the universe operates. Yeah. I love it, my friend. On on this topic, I have a couple more questions here before we wrap up, and I want to be mindful of your time. I know you're a busy man, and I appreciate you so well, it's much. Not that. It's just my wife, my wife is uh, ready to go for our walk. Oh, I love it. That's I can okay. feel it. I can feel it. Um, <laughs> well, I don't. I don't want to halt her. So, a few more questions, sir, that come up. So, I want to ask where within the future self paradigm that you are so passionate about, and we just hit on it just then a little bit. But I want to get practical with people. What, in your opinion, what are some spiritual practices that people can implement that can help them with their future self, with their future self relationship that come up? Other than, of course, you know, I just talked about the meditation that you had with the sculpture. What are some other things that bubble up that people can use? Well, I suppose it's to know that you, you're, you're going to meet your future self anyway, right? It's going to happen one day. You're going to meet the person you're going to become. But just take a moment to think about someone like Gandhi who basically worked out that he couldn't be who he was. He had to become something more because who he was, he wasn't the right person in order to have the impact that he wanted to have. So he said, be the change that you want to see in this world. Like I could look into the garden here and think about how I want this garden to turn out. I could do that exactly with me. Who do I actually want to be? Who could I be if I put my mind to it? And then to realize that that is there for you. Um, This is one of the things I say is, when you see that person, I'd say that it's not you, but it could be you. It, it could be you. This is the great thing about life is choice that human beings have. You could choose to become that person. The easiest thing to do is to choose to be who you are right now. So mm. we don't have to be our past. We can, we can evolve into something else. We can transcend. We can transform. We can move beyond. But I, I know sometimes I push people and I, I realize, I think people often do need a bit of pushing. <laughs> yes, 100%. You know? Well, I think, it's, I think it's because we often feel like we have to do it alone, right? And this, I think this, I want to hear more about your practices, but this connects beautifully into the collective mycelium analogy we were using before is that I think the relationship, I feel that the relationship with our future self, it doesn't have to be an isolated thing. Right. So for example, I, I spent a lot of time in your club and I come in and see the rooms that you host and, you know, you don't host rooms just with random people that pop in. They, they, random people do pop in, but I've noticed that most of the people that pop into your spaces, Pete, are the people that have already built a connection with you. And this connects to this idea that our relationship with our future self isn't just a relationship with our individual future self. If we decide to lean into it, I also think it's a relationship with a collective's future self because now, and I want to sit, hear your opinion on this, and this is going super spiritual and deep, deeply woo, that collective future self is the individual future self, meaning that when I have a individual goal that I'm moving towards or an individual embodiment of maybe manifesting a job, maybe manifesting a relationship, maybe manifesting more health. If I'm, if I'm doing that in a tribe of people that are also individually manifesting their future self, that's a superpower that's supercharging all of it. Do you resonate with that? My friend? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who was it that said, you know, on your own, great. What if you get together with someone else, then two become three, three become however you want to it becomes more powerful there's um the most powerful horses in the world are they're called belgium work horses and they can pull so much weight but when you bring two of them together that grew up together they can collectively pull more than they would have pulled it just 
the numbers, it's that com combination of energies that make a more powerful energy. And that's what I suppose life is. Life is energy, right? And it's what we can what we can do with it. But it just reminds me of the poem by Muhammad Ali, the shortest poem in his, of history, which is me, we, you know? That's what he said, me, we, they're, they're, you know, with me, there can be, everything I do is not just for me, it's for we. Yep. Oh, so. I love it. We can make a, we can make a, a whole other podcast just on that little point alone. I, um, I love you very much, my friend. And thank you for spending time with me. Sam. I'm really, pleasure. I'm it's really enjoying, pleasure. enjoying this chat. I have one more question, two more questions for you. Then we'll wrap this up. I, I want to just quickly for people listening, I want to ask, I want to ask you about your routine, right? Your routine with your future self. So for example, I, my routine, which I've actually built a little bit based off your coaching, right? It starts with meditation in the morning, starts with journaling, starts with affirmations, starts with visualizations. And then I have my self-care practices throughout the day. The, I think you call it, I can't remember, is it the six or the seven? Seven, the magnificent seven. Magnificent seven. That's it. I implement those throughout the day. And then I end my day with, with a, with another short meditation and gratitude. What I'm interested, Pete, in your personal life, what does your relationship with your future self in terms of its practices look like? Well, I get up at four o'clock in the morning, so I tend to go to bed by about eight. Um, I love to come downstairs. I drink a big vat of water with apple cider vinegar. Ooh. I put We've got hot water. I drink the coffee that's got the mushroom in it. Um, then I spend an hour just learning. I just love to either look at something that interests me, make notes on it. Then I'll ideally exercise this morning, but exercise, get my heart rate going, a bit stretching, a bit meditation. And then I go on clubhouse at six. So then I'm, I'm learning and I'm giving. And then afterwards it revolves around often just going for a walk. Um, and just every day building what I'm building. Cause I've, I've I've decided at the moment one of the big things I'm building at the moment. So I'm putting huge amounts of time and energy into that. Um, and that's it. You know, it's just it Simple. changes sometimes. I'm not too strict, but yeah. I like to, I know that without routine rituals, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble, you know, because yeah. I've got a very overactive mind. So I need to kind of navigate myself into pushing myself. Well, the, the rituals, Pete, uh, it's the balance between the masculine and the feminine, right? We forget that, you know, I define love as, and this is from my mentor, Mr. Paul Check. love is the flow of energy and information, right? What is the masculine energy of structure? It is information. What is the feminine energy that we need for creative insight? It is the flow. So we need the masculine structure of information. We need the feminine flow for energy to move, right? So it's for people listening, this is not just a Pete thing. It's not just a Harrison thing. This is something we could all cultivate with that balance throughout our day. I, Pete, last question before I get to it. I want to give you the space now. As you just said, you are building something. I, you are doing so much in the world, and I would love to give you the opportunity. Is there something you wish to promote and talk yeah. about at the moment? Yeah, I mean, anyone can do my 30-day kickstart program. It's free. You went through it. Um, just go to S1, S1. Dot me that's s1 the number one s1 s1 dot me you know take the challenge and um connect to your future self simple easy and what i'll do i'll if you're listening to the podcast go to the show notes and you'll see all the links to pete's beautiful face and his work that he's doing in the world pete final question here for you the, the cosmic love antenna the main intention is to help us connect inwards to our space of cosmic love so we can share it out into the universe, into the cosmos, across our mind, spirit, and body. My question for you is, how do you personally define that love word? It's just the, the best expression. It's the greatest thing you will ever do is love. It's just an energy. It's a feeling of being connected. It's the feeling of being alive, the gratitude of, of being alive. It's everywhere. It's just the choice that you make. It's not always the easiest choice to make, but there's no better choice than love. So get your antennae polished. Keep polishing it every day and give it because it's the greatest thing I'll ever give. 
beautifully said, my dear friend, as you heard it straight from the mycelium man's mouth, Pete, I love you very much. Thank you for spending this hour with me today here on the podcast. Thank you. If everyone's been listening in the clubhouse room, thank you for tuning in today. Everyone out there in the podcast world, I love you very much. Pete loves you very much. We'll catch you next time here on the Cosmic Love Antenna. But until then, have a beautiful evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And we'll see you next time here on a weekly periodic episode. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Cosmic Love Antenna podcast. We hope you enjoyed. Be sure to follow Harrison on Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at Harrison Ma. That's Harrison, M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Electric acid.